if we were to go and put yourself tw 40 years ago, so what year would that be, 40 years ago? 1972. Yeah, 1972. So we put yourself in 1972. How do people get around from place to place? Car. Ride their horse. Car. Car. Just like today. What do people do for entertainment? TV. They watch the TV. Which, yeah, some of you may not watch TV, and we have a lot more channels than the three or five channels, three, four, five channels they may have had in 1972. But all we did was improve what they had. If you're going to travel long distance, how did you travel? Train a plane. or a plane. A plane most of the time. How do you do it today? Plane. Still a plane. Did they have computers in 1972? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, they didn't have personal computers. Okay, they had computers. I mean, your calculators you use have more computing power than, than what sent a man to the moon and back. All right, just a couple years before that. And that took up multiple rooms uh, for that computer to do things. But they did have it. The reason why I was having you think of that way is from 1880 to 1920, in those 20, in those 40 years, you talk about dramatic changes. Because when people in 19 or 1880 were going from place to place, they usually took a horse or you would have train. What do we have in 1920? Horseless carriage. Yeah, the horse is So we have cars. We've had cars around them for a while. They had airplanes. Now, they didn't fly planes a whole lot in 1920, but you have planes. This is after World War I. Um, in 1880, we had some places had the kerosene lamps by that time. That was just first getting going. But most of the time, how did you light places up at night? A candle or a fireplace, you had fire. 1920, electricity. A little different. All right, entertainment, for one thing, in 1880, if you didn't have ways to have things lit up, what was your entertainment in 1880 once it got dark? Yeah, you really did do a whole lot. I mean, cities would, for a large part, shut down. 1920, in the 1920s, did the city shut down when it got dark? When, no, and this is where entertainment, you think of all the sports. So you can imagine if somebody was going in there in the Jersey City. Now, I don't know, your cities grew out and up. How do they grow up? Skyscrapers. Yeah, the skyscrapers. Now, how do skyscrapers come about? All right, still, because you can only build up four or five stories if you're going to use, use concrete blocks. Unless you build it like a pyramid, and then you have to really slope it up um, in there. Transportation, lighting change, entertainment changes um, with all the things that would happen. And that's where, that 40 years, there may not have been, if we were to try to take any 40 year period um, in, a, in American history or you think even world history. Because again, if we were to put you back in 1972, you're really not, it's not that different. Okay? As much as, oh, everything's changed. It hasn't in a lot of ways. What we've done is improved more of the things that have happened. We haven't made the dramatic changes. All right, the number one industry in the late 1800s, 1900s is the railroads. All right, plain and simple. When we had the Panic of 1873, the Panic of 1893, they both were caused initially by problems with the railroads that would lead to banking crises. I mean, the panics always end up affecting the banks in here. So the basis for trade is connecting the different sections of the country. This is why we'll have our farmers out west, our cities in the east on there. The sub-industries, still coal, all of that is related to the railroad industry. Our financial crisis would be related to that. Now, as the 1900s would go, the railroads would be re replaced, and by the time we get to post-World War II, by the automobile industry. What's our number one industry today? And you'd almost have to say technology. Although, this, where we say basically technology has taken over for the automobile industry, is our auto automobile industry still real important in America? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is where we recently had it where it was too big to fail for GM. So you kind of look at that. Yes, we are going in that direction.
But you still, even up to probably 20, 30 years ago, you could have pointed to the automobile industry being, being number one. So your lifetime is when basically we have to move to the digital, digital age um, there. All right, for the still, the one thing you need to, to remember on here, not one, but one of the things to remember is the Vesmer process. A lot of you have seen it, and what it does is it made it where the still was made a lot stronger. You see these giant, I'm not sure what, what you call them, the, the, the cauldrons that you would have. You would boil the still and you would pour it out, but as you're pouring out, they would shoot um, air through it. What, what, why would they shoot the air through it? To cool it. Not to cool it. Remove what? Impurities. Impurities. Okay, do I have it up there? Yeah. Okay, so injects air to remove impurities. Um, oh, I thought, I'm like, wow, that many people. They all yeah. brilliant. I did this. 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 And this is where I have for one of the other things you have. You'll end up with some phosphate that, that is in, um, in there. Um, Britain is where it was from, but the person that in America risked a lot was a guy by the name of Andrew Carnegie, who would ultimately be the second richest American. Now, there are three things needed to make still. Carbon. Iron ore, coal, and then it's limestone, limestone or the phosphate from that that you would have. One of the largest things of iron ore, or areas of iron ore, was found up in the very northern area of Minnesota. This is where we look back today, and at that time, um, it's of history. We kind of, we kind of look at that, and it was one of the areas we were kind of arguing with Canada over. But it's like, all right, who really cares about northern Minnesota? Yet, 50 years later, when we were arguing with Britain at that time about that area, it ended up being real important for us because it's one of the richest areas in the world for iron ore. We didn't know it at that time. Now, you take it from the northern area, go onto the Great Lakes with, with Lake Superior, and then John Boats there. We need coal, which, were, which are our largest areas of coal for the United States still today is the Ohio River Valley, West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, okay, areas close to the Ohio River. And then limestone, the limestone that they would use use in making this was from upstate New York. Now, we have those three things. Where, what, what city is known as Steel City? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Which is that closest to of those three items? Or the iron. Coal. All right, the coal. What do you think they needed the most of then? The coal. They needed the most of the coal. So that is why the center of our steel industry, which Pittsburgh, that's why the nickname of there is the Steelers. And this is where they'd have so many of the steel mills that would be made in Cleveland, uh, Pittsburgh, all right, in that area. And that's what? They needed more coal than anything else to get that heat and melt it. All right, and that's where, why Pittsburgh? That's the place that was close to it. You would, you would have to ship the iron ore, get over the Great Lakes, and then put it on trains. All right, the changes that they make, cities grow up and out. How did they grow out? Expanded. Yeah. But how? Transportation. All right, transportation. Because now, if we're going to, this is where the trains are interconnected right with this. If you live 20 miles outside of town, could you easily take a train into town and still work in that city? Mm -hmm. And so our public transportation. So we would have subways develop. Our elevated train lines would go. We also think of New York. It had a hard time before of connecting areas together in New York because we had rivers. Now with still, could you make a better bridge and make a bridge that could cross the Hudson River and the East River? All right, so this is where you're having the bridges in Ravikov. They grow up with skyscrapers, not only with the still, but we also had invented not too long before that. And here's, I mean, it's trivia, but you have but. Um, Otis is the person that invented the elevator, and the largest elevator company in the world today is Otis. So if you ever there, you can always tell people if you get an elevator and you see Otis written down there, tell them that's what the name of the elevator is. But this is where, for Otis, is the person that made the safety elevator. Right, they had elevators before, okay, but, but when you're making something that is going up 20, 30 stories, you want something that if something breaks, you have a way for it to automatically stop. Because right, most people don't like to die. 
Okay, so this is where, but that's, you combine that together and you're able to, and what happened with the buildings, as you are able now to build up in a city and the population can keep growing, you're going up, you're going out. You have these other factories and that's where they're all in together with each other. Um, and that's where we have with a safety elevator, we'd have things if the, if the cable was to break, where they, they would break. Um, so subways, rail lines would expand out. Okay, the yield, U.S. Steel Corporation would be made in here. Now, I'm not going to go as in-depth. This is something that history teachers usually really pound about, about vertical integration, horizontal consolidation. What is vertical? Up, up and down. Okay, up and down. So if you see something with horizontal integration, first of all, think monopolies. Okay, and this is how Carnegie had decided. What he did to try to control the steel industry, he never got a true monopoly, but he owned things all along the way. He owned the, the iron ore mines in Minnesota and throughout other parts of the United States. He owned the coal mines. He owned railroads that would be coming in to those cities, transportation. So even if he didn't own a steel mill, he probably was selling something to somebody that did own it. And if he decided he was going to buy your steel mill, you might tell him no, and he could probably put you out of business. Because if Dylan owns a steel mill and I am Carnegie, and I tell Dylan, I want to buy your steel mill for $20 million. Of course, it cost him $25 million to build it, but I want to buy it for $20 million. If he tells me no, that's fine. All I have to do is drop the price of my steel that I'm making in all these other steel plants to a lot lower where he's not going to make money, and I turn around and raise the money on his iron ore, because he's buying them from my mines, and increase his cost, and what's going to happen to him? Nobody's going to Hey, he's going to go bankrupt. And then instead of paying him $20 million for it, I'll pay the bank $10 million for his old steel mill. Okay, and that's where vertical integration, though, is you own the things from top to bottom, and those way to get monopolies. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, this is where you're going to see this name for Carnegie and J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan is the person that at that time people thought was the most powerful man in the United States. And he was. He may not have been the richest, but he was the most powerful. He ultimately would buy out Carnegie as well as other still. When I was watching the Men in America thing, it said that Vanderbilt first started all monopolies and then Rockefeller tried to take over him and stuff like that. And this is and that's why they, that's why that, that, that show is good and actually it will be on sale in January. I might buy it. We might watch some of it like for review. Um, but that's where it, the thing and thing that you have is Carnegie actually worked some for Vanderbilt, so he learned about a lot of those tactics and how to do things. Um, in here, and, it's, and that's why I never realized the connection between a lot of those men that that, that they had that, that that show didn't show um, in there. But J.P. Morgan would come about. Now, J.P. Morgan was not a self-made man. His he was born rich, but he made himself even richer. But he became very powerful, and realistically, he would end up buying out Carnegie. And we'll kind of come back to Carnegie and one of the things that later on in his life, um, reason why he would sell out. And J.P. Morgan probably overpaid. Uh, at the time, but he wanted it, okay, and he had the money to, with other investors to have it. It was the first billion dollar corporation, that would be bigger than anything we have today. Alright, oil, alright, we have steel industry, now we have oil. In the early 1900s, our oiling was from well oil. This is something that's like a forgotten part of American history. We would have ships come out from New England, they would kill the wells, get their blubber, and use that oil. Now, it wasn't used very much for lamps. The oil was used for lubrication, especially on a lot of our machines that, that we would have. Uh, then we would have kerosene that was discovered. Now, if we had a fire in here, and I had a string of kerosene, it would not make anything dramatic like in a movie. All right, you're not going to have these big explosions. Because what happens with kerosene? It can actually put out a match. Say what? It can actually put out a match. Yeah, I mean, if you, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a thicker oil. It'll burn. Now, if kerosene, if we had a good enough fire and I was to throw it and get air mixed in with it, then it makes a nice little poof 
with things. Um, yeah, but it's not like gasoline. You're not going to have explosions. It just burns on top. If we have a barrel of kerosene, we throw a match on the top of it, we can get it lit, and it's just going to be the, the burnt oil on the top is going to burn. Um, some of you that have maybe have seen some like old World War II movies or even a Band of Brothers, they, they'll do that. They'll throw some things out and just make a fire to warm up and just burn it off the top. Kind of like diesel fuel and some of you that have dealt with that. Do the same thing. So it's not explosive, so you can put it in lamps and it was a lot safer. Um, it took a little while, but in 1859 we found a lot more oil um, in, in Pennsylvania. But the person that ends up coming up bigger for this is then Rockefeller. Rockefeller realizes how much people want this. And he would use what is called horizontal consolidation. Just like vertical integration, sometimes they will call it vertical integrate or horizontal integration for this case. If you see horizontal consolidation or horizontal integration, think monopoly. It's a way to get a monopoly. Now, vertical means you buy everything from beginning to end. Horizontal is you find one little section of it and you control that one section. Rockefeller realized it wasn't so important, not, not so much there's too much risk in trying to drill for the oil. Let's get the refineries. And at one time it controlled over 90% of the refineries in America. Now the big thing he made money from is kerosene because people converted over to kerosene. Instead of having candles, you'd have kerosene. It was a lot safer to have. Plus, it was a lot more portable and a little easier to use um, in there. Um, later on, he, his company would become known as Standard Oil. We will have a major case when we would get, get into the early 1900s where they're breaking up these monopolies and Standard Oil is broken apart. Um, in there. Which from there we have a bunch of companies like Chevron, Exxon, a lot of our major companies end up coming out of there. Even when they broke it up, Rockefeller made more money. Mm -hmm. um, and saw one thing that actually for Rockefeller when he died, the latest conversion of his money would be somewhere like $600 billion, so basically 10 times as rich as Bill Gates today. Give or take a few dollars. Okay, so you think with Bill Gates, he's not close to what Rockefeller was. Okay, and when you put it in today's money. Um, what's kind of funny with this is we have a byproduct that they, that they had that they never could figure out what to do with, and literally for most of his plants was near the Ohio River, have pipes pouring gasoline out because they didn't know what to do with gasoline, didn't want to use it because it was explosive, which is one reason why when they built automobiles, gas was so cheap because, again, it was a waste product that that's why they made automobiles run by gasoline. It's kind of ironic to us today to think of what was the, I mean, you're just pouring it out. also shows you what their environmental laws were at that time. <laughs> um, they do that. But that is where for Rockefeller with oil. All right, now electricity, the third, the, the third of the three major things that we have. Because we have steel, we have oil, we have electricity. The one you think of the most in that is Thomas Edison. Most people think of the light bulb. He made a lot more than just the light bulb. Okay. What is a phonograph? It like records things. Basically, it's recorded. Basically, it was like a record player. And there was a way to record it, put it on, and then you could play it over again. Um, Edison was kind of upset in the beginning that people were using it for entertainment because he was he was wanting to use it more for, for learning and to help people with disabilities. Um, and he was kind of upset that that's what it's used. But he did make the most mis motion picture camera and of course the most famous thing is the light bulb. Um, he would have a lab in New York or New Jersey. He would also have a home here in Flo Florida. He came down in the winter. A couple other robber, robber barons that were his neighbors. Um, one guy was a guy by the name of Henry Firestone. Was one of his neighbors. You know what Firestone made his millions on? Tires. Tires. Firestone Tire. And this other guy, Henry Ford. I think you've ever heard of Henry Ford? Nah. Okay. Could you imagine if you were a young person, an entrepreneur, and you got to sit around listening to Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and Henry Firestone talking Holy business? Man. You think you might be able to learn something by just sitting there and listening to this? Man? Which is part of the reason why for years Firestone tires were what was on Ford vehicles, because not only their friendship, but they combined their business-wise. Now, connection to J.P. Morgan. Edison's company was known as Edison Electric. 
Today, that company is no longer known as Edison Electric because J.P. Morgan, who basically bet on Thomas Edison, and then Edison wasn't as competitive. He was a brilliant mind. And Morgan basically took over Edison's company. And Edison ended up working for J.P. Morgan is what ended up happening with that. And General Electric, our biggest um, conglomerate that we have today. Now, George Westinghouse, and then just kind of finish real quick with him. Westinghouse would make what today we think of as transformers. Which means, if you go, and let's say you did go put in one of the plugs over here, you put something in, you're going to get shocked. Unless you have some sort of heart problem, you're not going to die. But what happens when you go out on the one of the lines out there and you decide to grab it? <laughs> if you're grounded, that's the only time. Right, you're grounded, all right, and you're not going to do so well. And that's what Westinghouse would do. Westinghouse, I mean, sorry, Edison didn't really do, I was rushed through yesterday with, with Westinghouse. And this is where Tesla, who was an employee for Edison, was actually the one that, that came up with the ideas. But one thing you're going to notice here is even though we have Edison and Tesla were the scientists, the ones doing the work, they might be the brains behind something, but in order to make money on it, we had Edison and Westinghouse. Westinghouse is still um, a major corporation that we have today in electronics. And for what, that, what he made, and this is where I have the picture of Transformers, and the main idea that they took where AC current is a lot more dangerous than, than DC, um, alternating current. Uh, there, but by taking transformer, they were able to go and make it where it was safer. Um, this is where if you do watch the show, The Myth That Made America, you can also see, see here where, and they actually portray this. And I think in some ways maybe Edison looked like maybe he was a little naive. And then when he tried to be a little bit, I hate to say dirty, but um, when he tried to get his hands wet a little bit, he made it where he's actually the person that invents the electric chair, uh, which is true. He's the one that, that made it. But he made it when they used the electric chair for the first time that they, they didn't use DC, which is what he was wanting, but AC, which is what his competitor and what Westinghouse was actually promoting um, there. People didn't realize that, okay, for most people, I mean, they don't know the difference between DC and AC current, all right, and really don't care to know. All they know is they'll plug something in. So all they knew is, wait a minute, you killed somebody using electricity on purpose. Okay, that's what they they were aware. And it made Edison, and Edison spent a lot of time with his life trying to make himself look better. Yes, Sarah? Um, on the Make Me America, do you take notes on it? Yeah, I have the sheet. Although I don't, I don't know if they're gonna. I don't think they're showing. They, I think they've stopped it now. Now that they've gone through with things, but if you find out it's coming again, I'll still give the extra credit for watching it. Um, but I think the reason, reason why they're probably gonna stop for the next two months is they're now putting it up for sale. Oh. So, and although if you if you buy it, you can't get it till January. Hmm. So, uh, and now they're promoting the Mankind Show, which I haven't seen much of it. I watched a little bit. Look good, real good if you're doing AP World History. Um, it's actually incredible for that. I mean, it's kind of showing the highlights of that. All right, other inventions. First of all, the typewriter. Christopher Scholes. This is trivial. If you remember Christopher Scholes, all right, that's a great memory to have. Um, no, we did not make the shoe inserts. That's not Dr. Scholes. It's a little different. Now, I have on there why the, the QWERTY or QWERT keyboard. Anyone know why we made the keyboard the way it is today? For our hand. Are most of you right hand or left handed? Right. Okay, so left hand is your strong is, is your weak hand. Where are the letters that you use most? On your strong hand or weak hand? Your right hand. It's actually on your weak hand. On purpose. Because where we have A S D F. That would be, those are very commonly used letters. It's on your left hand. They actually, because the old fashioned typewriters, and if you ever go, they had these bars that go back and forth, back and forth. If you type so fast, they got caught up together. So they actually made the keyboard to slow you down because the machine could not go as fast as what you had. So they purposely made it where you had things on the weaker hand. They, we have designed a keyboard that is actually better for speed 
but people don't use it. Why? Yeah, you've been taught how to do it this way. Uh, which actually comes because when you talk about change in time for school, a big debate that comes around for schools or not is whether or not elementary schools should require cursive to be taught. Okay, I know Mr. Harper's there saying yes, it should, um, but some schools have eliminated that for the standards. Um, California, this is a big debate in California because they have requirements that you have to have certain keyboarding skills by the time you are in third grade, but they, are, they were debating whether or not should they still require cursive to be taught in the elementary schools. So, um, and that's, but it kind of shows where things have changed over time. Well, could we change a whole at a generation to get to a keyboard that actually makes it where you are faster instead of purposely trying to slow us down? But that probably won't happen. I don't see any time soon. Um, the telephone, most of you know, with, with Alexander Graham Bell making the, the first telephone. He was actually trying to invent something to help out people that, that were hearing impaired. Um, several members of his family were hearing impaired, and so that's where when he was inventing it. The camera, this may not seem important. Now, George Eastman made the Kodak camera. Um, those of you that know all of, of different corporations, we have Eastman Kodak Corporation. Um, he did not invent the camera, but the, Co the Kodak camera. What it made, it was, you know the old fashioned type of cameras were the ones that they, you would have to go and they, and you think about it, you probably saw movies or shows where you had this poof, and then it took a little bit of time for the senders to kind of go through. But what you would have, and, and Mr. Boudreau would be able to explain a lot more, you'd have to have your shutter open for a certain amount of time. You could not have action shots. So you had to be perfectly still for like two or three seconds to take a picture. Well, he made a camera where it used film. You still couldn't do full action shots, but it was able to be real quick. The main difference was, and this is one of the themes I hope that you see with these inventions, now suddenly cameras could be used by middle class people. Yeah. Um, but this is where, where the, for, for normal middle class people, they were able to buy a camera. If we were to take in today's money, if you were to take a picture, it would cost for one picture to take, it might cost you 50 hundred dollars. Are y'all going to take very many pictures? Cool. That's why when you look at old pictures and something like that, it might be one picture at your wedding that you took. Or if you got a whole bunch of family members together, you took one picture. Suddenly with the Kodak camera, and now this would be, seem expensive to you all, but now suddenly the pictures came out where it was in today's money, two or three dollars a piece. Would you take more pictures then? Now think where we are now. You can take a picture. Oh, I don't like it. Let's take another one and delete it. All right? So, I mean, that's where the technology comes in. But the key thing, the reason why I put this camera in here with some of these other things that we have is the idea that we're now getting to common people. The camera was something mainly just for the rich. Now common people get it. The safety razor. <laughs> King Gillette. Recognize that name? All right, Gillette razors are still around today. And with the safety razor, and if you go to the barber shop here in Inverness and downtown, they still will use an old-fashioned razor blade, I mean the big blade and cut in there. But this made it where you didn't have to go to a barber. You could actually go, and this is another thing I want to say, normal middle-class families that you could go and have something like this. Which is also why, for some of the things that we'd have, and you notice that with these presidents, we're starting to see a little bit different styles with their beards and mustaches, um, and some of the things that came because of them. All right, if you see, if you ever see R and D, research and development, a lot of corporations would have this, and this is where today a lot of universities would have that. Um, and the idea that they would do is, and they would work together and trying to find new products. Then get a patent. All right, here's where I'm kind of summarizing a lot of things. When you see the term robber barons, these are the richer people. Where we saw in the, the video there, that, sh that short clip with Cleveland, uh, what they, they say, 1% of the people... One, one, eight, one, eight, one, eight, one eight, eight own seven eighths of right. the wealth. And here's where we have the argument today about the 1% and 99%. Well, you see that disparity is, was even greater at that time. It was one of the greatest stretches that we have from the extreme of uh, the rich. 
Now, a lot of people claim to be, and you'll see this term, self-made men. Carnegie is a great example of a self-made man. Carnegie was a very poor child of an immigrant who comes to be the second richest man in the United States. But most of them weren't like that. Most people already had some sort of money in there. But the thing that Carnegie kind of gets with it is that American dream. You could be that. Was Bill Gates like Carnegie or is he like J.P. Morgan? J.P. Morgan was born into money. So was Bill Gates our richest man in America? Was he what? Yeah, he's like Carnegie. So he's like our modern day Carnegie that he was able to go and go from basically modest upbringings, because he was a normal middle class kid. He really wasn't much different from you all uh, there. And now, and now he is the richest man in the United States. Um, Rockefeller was that way also. Rockefeller was not a rich person. Um, to go. But most of our other ones were up there. Uh, J.P. Morgan, again, I, I kind of mentioned I haven't had as much of a section with him, but he will be one that is just, he's involved with things. He'll buy out Carnegie. He's the one that takes over General Electric. Uh, he is, for almost three decades, realistically, the most powerful man in the United States. Notice on that president's video that we had, they mentioned him, not presidents. Okay, He is the one that had it. Here are other names to have. I didn't do much about Cornelius Vanderbilt. But Cornelius Vanderbilt made his money, first of all, through ferries, but later on with railroads. Um, Gustavius Swift, which we have Swift Foods today, meatpacking industry. And what city was that located in? Chicago. Yeah, a lot of it in Chicago. Isaac Singer, sewing machines. How would sewing machines change things? Right, faster to make clothing. It's a lot. It also made it a lot cheaper. Provided jobs for women. All right, here is I mean a major invention. Even though each singer improved upon what they had, the, the Singer Corporation. Brenda, do you need to stand in the back? No, I'm good. Uh, but these are some of the robber barons here in Florida. We'll have John Stetson. Anybody know where the Stetson University is named after him? Anybody know what John Stetson made his fortune at? It was a robber baron. What? Nah, it's not. Hats. Stetson, he was one of the biggest hat makers. And at this time, that's when hats were something of fashion for men. Uh, <coughs> they would have that specific kind of hat. Or? Just basically one of the fashionable hats at that, that time period. Um, notice of Vanderbilt, and some of you with your names. Anybody know what Vanderbilt's nickname was? Commodore. Yeah, the Commodore. Vanderbilt University is the Commodores, which here's where you have the gospel of wealth. Andrew Carnegie, or you see, you hear sometimes it's Carnegie, all right, depending on what area of Pennsylvania you're from is how you would pr pronounce it. Uh, there. Again, he becomes extremely wealthy. He had a, sort of a rivalry with Rockefeller. One thing that made these men so great is their fact that they, they were so competitive. Now, they're so competitive that sometimes they would sacrifice other people for more of a profit. And this is where that, with this, the, the show, The Men that, that Made America, they kind of point this out with a lot of things. Carnegie, though, was really a very good-hearted man. He was not the cruel businessman that some people think of. But his businesses were not making enough money. So one of the things that he did, and he, he actually hired a guy that was that cutthroat business got to take over, and he went off to Scotland for an extended vacation for a while and let Frank take over his business uh, for a while. And he did a lot of things of made more profit, but also the things that wasn't good for the workers. Uh, and when we get to the strikes, we're going to see where that comes back to haunt um, Carnegie. But Carnegie was one that after he made all this money, he wrote the gospel of wealth. Right now, I said I don't want you to to go to for jumping ahead. But one of the most things that, that my students in the past have got confused on is social gospel and gospel of wealth. Right now, realize gospel of wealth is Carnegie. So all together, gospel of wealth is Carnegie. Okay, now that was not gospel of wealth is Carnegie. Gospel of wealth is Carnegie. Okay. Social gospel is not, although they are very similar in, the, in what they would end up doing. And this is straight out of Carnegie. This is the rich. Basically, he says, God made you rich for a purpose. 
God picked Carnegie, picked Rockefeller out, picked Bill Gates out, and made them rich for a purpose. But that purpose is, if you do get rich, to give back. Now, when you give back, do you go around and say, oh, here's $10,000, here's $10,000, $10,000. All right, you wish? Yeah, but Carnegie, is Carnegie a guy that basically worked and truly pulled himself up from the bootstraps? Is he going to go and hand out money to people? No, you got to... One thing that Carnegie had, and one thing he's most famous for, is the money he gave to libraries. He established libraries all over the United States. I think it was over 70 cities that he put libraries in. The reason being is at that time period, people, when he was growing up, the rich people had books. But thanks to what Ben Franklin had done before him, we had one of the biggest established libraries in the United States. And he was able to go to a library, and when he wanted to learn about something, he could go and get a book and learn about it. And so what, what basically Carnegie said, said with the establishing of the idea of the gospel of wealth is, I'm not going to give you $10,000, but I'm going to give you a chance to learn where you can make this. If you're willing to go out and research on it, you can do this. Take it in today's terms. Does Bill Gates live up to the gospel of wealth? Yes. Yeah, he does. Okay, the Millennium Scholarship. He's already pledged a third of his money to other people. Um, his own sons, all right? Now, they're not going to be hurt for money. But even though Bill Gates is worth $60 million or something like that, depending on what Microsoft's shares are at today, he's only set aside a couple million dollars for his own children. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind it. I'm, I'm kind of wanting Bill Gates to adopt me. But... He has to answer my letters, all right? And with Santa Claus, they both won't answer them. But they, but they, um, but this is where he has the thing for money. Bill Gates could easily come in here and hand each of you ten thousand dollars, but he's not going to. What he has is scholarships, and he is the biggest scholarship program in the United States and the world. If you are willing to, or most of you are, middle class kids. Do what Bill Gates said. You have something. You have a chance then to, to do it in um, there, and that's why he, he kind of lives up to that. Now, I don't have a whole big section on this, and this is one that's actually where watching the men of America, the Johnstown flood, the worst man-made disaster that we've had um, life-wise in in American history. Okay, the the um, that's not war or terrorism related. What happened was that Henry Frank, the guy that was, that was friends with Carnegie, had built this nice club. And they put a dam and made a beautiful lake for all these rich people with this, this club. And time and time again, they, have, they said, there's some problems with this dam. But, eh, you know, why spend the extra money fixing it? So they didn't, they didn't fix it. And eventually, the, when the dam broke, then I can't remember how many people ended up dying, but I mean, hundreds of people that lived downstream were basically flooded and killed. For some reason, I'm thinking 600 or something, but don't quote me on that. And Carnegie was a member of this club. He is, he kind of had Frank involved with this. And part of this is where he was trying, some people say that Carnegie kind of felt where he needed to try to redo his image. He didn't want to be seen where Rockefeller was seen as this stingy, stingy um, rich man. Um, the Homestead strike, when we get to the strikes, time to talk about that, where these workers strike, and then basically where Frank was in charge, and we have these Pinkertons actually shoot and kill eight or nine of the workers when they're striking. And it made a bad image for Carnegie there, because he's the one that owned that mill. Um, so Carnegie's trying. Now, Rockefeller seen as this really stingy rich guy that wouldn't give his money. He actually gave twice as much money than what Carnegie gave. But most people don't realize that. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, Sarah? Um, is this around the same time as when all those women died in the factory with fire? We will have the triangle. The triangle will, will occur not too long after that. It's the same time period that's a little bit later, and that helped with some things. And that's actually when we get to need. All right. Now, one of the people that we had our people reports early on was Horatio Alger. This is why you're going to start seeing some of these people on, on this. He wrote... Dime, they're dime novels. Why are those books called dime novels? Yeah, yeah they were cheap books. Dime. Now today, today when we when we convert it over today, that would be almost like ten dollar books. That's not real expensive, but it's not. But could a could a middle class person afford a ten dollar book? And that's where it's kind of like the same thing. Before, only rich people could have have the books. 
Um, Devin, they need you immediately in student services. Um, but this is where the dime novels came out. Well, Horatio Alger wrote these books, the Pluck and Luck series. Uh, here you see, From Farmer to Senator, Risen from the Ranks. Uh, I think it was like 70 something books. That he and realistically, it's kind of like a lot of the movies we have today. It's the same story, you just replace the characters and change it around. But the idea is that with the hard work and a little bit of, of luck, okay, you happen to have the right circumstances, you can, you can achieve the American dream. And that's the idea that he wrote, which, especially for immigrants. Yeah. Are we interested in what in plus series? Is it to be fuck? Yeah. Yeah, it should be luck and pluck. Oh, it should be luck and pluck? Yeah. Yeah. It's luck and pluck. Thanks for the point. It is luck and pluck, oh, not okay. puck and pluck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, social Darwinism. What is Darwinism? Survival of the fittest. All right, survival of the fittest. What does that have to do with businesses? Yeah, the strongest business survive. And here's where we get to the ethical debate. What if you go with means that maybe aren't always good, but you crush your competition? Is that okay? No. Yeah. And at this time period, this is where a lot of people were looking at things and saying, oh, yeah, we can't. We're also going to see social Darwinism has also creeped into things when it comes to race. There are groups that said, well, there's certain races that are. Yeah. Um, what if you have it where you end up with uh, eh, some bribes? That Gilded Age, remember all those scandals in Grant's presidency? Well, if you have the money to pay someone off, should you be able to do it? Should we have laws doing this? How much should the government have not to? Which the main policy we had in America, and know this word, laissez-faire, it means hands off. Here's where today's people say we should do this in economic state. We have too much government regulation. Today we would call this deregulation. And at what point is it that we have too much government intervention? And here's the debate that we constantly have. How much do we need for government protecting people and protecting workers compared to stifling businesses? And that was actually part of the debate in this last election. And there where Romney was saying on his first day of presidency that he would eliminate 10,000 regulations that have been made. In a bunker. Yeah. So, well, in a bunker. Even though he couldn't do that, Congress would have to. But it doesn't matter in a campaign. But that is where we still have this debate today. Have we made too much government regulation? What should be done? So, the yeah. Lafayette Fair says that the government shouldn't be in economics, or it should be? Basically, remember that name, Adam Smith? Adam Smith, who is what we base our economy upon, he's the one that said government should be, get basically stand away from it. The invisible hand will guide things. If you don't like what Rockefeller's doing, then, well, don't buy his oil. There's only one problem with that. Yeah, when he owned over 90% of it, did you have a choice? When you, when you wanted to put kerosene in your lamp at that time, you had really no choice than to buy standard oil because he had made a monopoly on it. And that's where, and I'm kind of getting to what will actually be in our next section um, in here, when we get to the, the Unit 7 in here. How are we going to, how big can a business become? All right, how much are we going to allow the South Social Darwinism? And that's where you mentioned about the fire. All right, what if? I mean, should, should the workers matter along the way here? And when people said, oh, wait, this has gone too far. All right, corporations. This is one of the boring things in it in here, but here. A corporation as a legal entity is a person. Coca-Cola is a person. Now you can own shares of the stock. Can you sue Coca-Cola? Yeah. Yes. Just like you can sue a person. Now the difference is, is where they have limited liability. If I own shares of stock in Coca-Cola and you sue it, what's the most that I can lose? Whatever I own in stocks. If I own $10,000 worth of shares of stocks, the most I could lose is $10,000. If I own $2,000, the most I could lose is $2,000. So that's where it comes down to that there's only a certain amount. Those of you, some future lawyers in here, a good lawyer knows how to twist things. Sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. 
The 14th Amendment. Remember that from Reconstruction? You could not discriminate because of race, creed, or color. If legally a corporation is a person, can you discriminate against a corporation? So, Standard Oil Company is a corporation. Can you make a law limiting what Standard Oil Company does? Now, do you think in the Reconstruction period when the 14th Amendment was written, saying, and here you see on here, each state shall deny it to any person equal protection of law, do you think that they were meaning for corporations? Yeah. But legally, it's stated that way. Meanwhile, what's happening in the South while these corporations are using the 14th Amendment? Jim Crow laws are going about. <laughs> All right, social Darwinism, okay? Is the government contributing to the survival of the fittest? Yeah. All right, limited liability. This is where it comes down to that you can only sue for a certain amount of things. Um, Rockefeller could only be sued for whatever he owned in Standard Oil. Now, he owned most of the shares of stock. Other people owned it there. The key word I want you to remember in this is caveat and poor. Let the buyer beware. If you bought some food and got food poisoning from it, where yesterday we shut down another peanut butter factory in, in New Mexico, not a little salmonella, that's just a little extra flavoring in your peanut butter. But as we, as we shut it down, and this is where that government regulation comes in, should we really be worried about this? I mean, if you buy your jar of peanut, peanut butter and you get a little food poisoning from it, well, that was the risk you took, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, the philosophy back in the eight, late 1800s was that, caveat and poor. Well, you knew when you bought it, you took that risk. And here's where we come to the whole argument of government regulation. How much government regulation do we need of peanut butter factories? Not to really be safe. But how much is enough? So, will we maybe overreact to this and make it too many things and maybe put some of the, some of the factories out of business? All right, with regulation. I don't know. And that's, but that is the old thing. So you notice there's two different Latin terms you must know for this, laissez-faire and caveat in poor. Okay, and do know these Latin terms. I mean, this, and this is not just with history. This is with government. This is with economics. So you'll have them next year. All right, as Robert Barrett became richer, government started cracking down on monopolies. The one thing that they ended up having. Now, I am going to make, this is one of the most boring things, as y'all are seeing here with your excitement. Taylor, get your head up also. Um, but this is where I can go really deep in this. I'm not going to go near as deep. When you see anything for, for these different words, think monopoly. When you see the word trust, like it's a Sherman Antitrust Act, what should you think? Sherman Anti-Monopoly Act. When you see pools or pool arrangement, trust, holding companies, these are all just different words that they use for making a monopoly. You may not have one company, but what if we have five different companies, but you're on the board of directors for all five companies? Is that still, and you have basically your same board of directors, is that still a monopoly? Yeah, it's five companies, but they're the same people own all five of them. And that's what was happening that you would have. People were saying we needed to have some laws. And here, put stars, arrows by the Sherman Antitrust Act. This is one of our top 10 laws made in the history of the United States. It was supposed to stop monopolies. And I'm keeping it simple here that antitrust means anti-monopoly. It had some really good rules. It had really no enforcement provisions. So you're not allowed to speed. But if you speed, nothing happens to you. How many of you going to obey the speed limit this afternoon then? if that was the case. Are you really worried about it, or is that just a suggestion? And that's the problem they have. If you're a corporation and you have all these work rules, if you follow the rules, it makes your business weaker. If you break the rules, you're stronger, you make more money, and nothing happens to you, why should you follow the rules? 
So the Sherman Antitrust Act was good in, in, in its paper. theory and on paper, but yeah, it wasn't very good. You know, I mentioned lawyers here before. Here's where we have lawyers again. They didn't use it against the businesses. They used it against labor unions. They used it to break up labor unions. Uh, again, not the intent of it, but that's what it was sometimes used against. All right, boom and bust. The economy went up and down, up and down. It was kind of like a roller coaster. The only thing is, is some of you would really like this roller coaster because it went up real fast and went down real fast. There were, think about how many times have I put these two panics in your, in your um, notes? Is this like probably the fifth time that I've had in the notes so far? With the, do you think you need to know the panic of 1873 and 1893? Am I, by repetition, am I trying to just drill this into your head? Okay, and this is where just somehow or another put that in, in your in your your mind for for one to remember. But what happened in Panic in 1873 is we had the railroads expand and the banks fell and we had a major crisis. 1893, we would have that happen again. We would have, and at that time they called it the Great Depression. Why would it lose the name of the Great Depression then? Yeah, the, the next one was even greater. But at that time, it was our worst one that we'd have. Um, here, where it's all the, the film, about the one eighth, only seven eighths of it, we had it. Carnegie made $23 million on the same year that the average person made $500. Wow. Or $498. Dude, what $23 million be Sometimes you can say you can add a zero, but you would actually be even more than that. Realistically, realistically, you would be adding a, with his time period. Actually, we'd be probably multiplying it twice. That probably you're you're talking about probably about two point three billion. Why was he taxed? All right, and there's your question. He wasn't taxed. We did not have income tax. Meanwhile, if you are a farmer, the old system of tax, even if you had half of your cows die that year, you got taxed on your cows that lived. Our tax system was really outdated. So you had people that make it and they didn't get taxed on stuff. That's where people kind of look today. Do we have a tax system that maybe is outdated now? Because our tax system we have today is almost 100 years old. Here's where the Populist Party, remember farmers supporting the Populist Party, were saying that they needed to, to have more with the, the tax. Um, the main way that the government got its money, or when you see the word revenue, that's taxes. Tariffs, and then what is it, excise tax? Not exported. <coughs> like the whiskey tax, cigarette tax, gas tax, it would be on a certain item. But do you think kerosene got taxed? You think Rockefeller's going to let that get taxed? No, that's what a common person needs to light their home. So this is where, I'll, this is where again that populist party is coming about and fighting for the normal people. And I say, how does this fit into the populist ideas? Now, jumping ahead a little bit, this is where we would have the that the 17th Amendment and 16th Amendment with the, with the senators and then the income tax. These would be pushed pushed later on in history. All right, union growth. Here's our rapid review of unions. First one started with the Lao system. Remember the women workers in the factories? They had put together a union. It didn't get a whole lot in there. If you remember National Labor Union, then you're pretty good. Um, it died out, though, later on. A lot of the people didn't like it because they didn't want to involve women in, in, in the union in here. Molly McGuire's. This is not a real union, but it, they acted like a union. It's kind of a mix between a union and a terrorist group. Wait, why were they against the women workers? Because they felt that women, women, because you could pay women less, and so they didn't want women to be working in the factory because that would lower the salary for the men, or that's competition for the men. So that's why they were against women. I know I had a question in there on that. Okay, but that's where, yeah, women got paid less. Because you pay a woman basically half the price of a man. So if you're a union, do you want to have women workers in your factory? So that's competition for job. The Molly McGuire's, where I said it's kind of like a mixture between a union and terrorist workers. What ethnicity do you think 
a lot of these people were? Nick Wire. Irish. All right, Irish. This is where there are a lot of Irish coal miners. And they're working in the coal mines. Now, coal mines are really safe places and fun places to work, aren't they? Yes. I mean, I know that right now a lot of you have that on your career goals when you did it in eighth grade. You said, oh, my number one job, I want to be a coal miner. All right, I think that black lung thing sounds like really fun. Okay, that's cool. Okay, it's breathing this. Okay, I want to work underground for 12, 14 hours a day and then come out and see the sunlight. Uh, and not get paid much. And you never know, it may not be that safe, but hey, go ahead and work. And a lot of people died. Well, these Irish coal miners didn't like the idea of it. And what the Molly Maguires would do, and let's see, do I, did I put a picture with it? No, I didn't. Uh, but they would actually have, and it was like a skull and crossbones. But when things got a little bit unsafe, their way was basically send a message to to the, the, their supervisors that fix it or else. And what's the or else? Kill, gonna kill you. Yeah, basically sometimes it may not kill you, they just might come and just in the middle of the Breathe night take you out and just beat the heck out of you. Okay, and so, so it, that's why I say it's not a true union, but are the workers joining together to get some changes done? So that's why I kind of I put it in here. Uh, but it is an example of and when we would have some people come in. All right, the Knights of Labor. This was our first union. Hopefully you know, Knight, Terrence Powderly. This is where your people report is. If you see Terrence Powderly, you think of Knights of Labor. It welcomes <coughs> skilled and unskilled labor. If you all are working in my factory, Haley, you got the job that you turn around, you put this nut, and you screw it onto to the, to the bolt. And you do that all day long. Okay. Meanwhile, Taylor, you are a welder. Okay, you have to go through and weld this precision piece on. Who's skilled and who's unskilled? Taylor's skilled and who's not skilled. Now, with the union, I'm going to go through with the biggest thing that you have here. This is where the, the problem that the Knights of Labor would have. If you went on strike, is Haley helping your argument, Taylor? Because how easy is it for me to replace Haley and her? <laughs> Pretty hard, I don't know, and that was ultimately that will be the well, downfall of the Knights of Labor. They incorporated everybody together in that union, whether you were someone that had a skill or not. We're seeing it right now with the labor strike going on with Hostess on there. So the, the Twinkie con controversy. And here, the bakers compared to people that were just laborers in there. Okay, they kind of, I mean, they're all together as one group, okay, who's skilled in it, and that's one reason why that strike probably isn't going to work out. Another problem that you'll have, and you'll see this with unions again and again, and somewhere I know I'll have a question along the way with it is, you will end up with, a, with them having anarchists involved, sometimes communists, sometimes socialists. When they were doing a strike at what is called Haymaker Square, and when you see Haymaker Square connected with the Knights of Labor, here's where putting your SFIs together. But when they were doing the strike, some anarchists that were not in, not part of that, but they were basically associated with it, they decided to set off some bombs and we ended up having seven people killed uh, and, six, and over 60 people injured, both sides, uh, police officers as well as strikers. And so people got started to associate the Knights of Labor in that union there and they would ultimately die out. The main thing with Knights of Labor, again, remember Haymaker Square, Terrence Powderly, okay, they would die out. But they would they would start, basically they would open the way up. This was our first true union that we had. I told you a long time ago in here, whenever there's a doubt on anything, when if you're taking an AP exam and you never know something with a with a question and you're taking a wild guess on it, if you see AFL, take that as the answer. Now, if you know the right answer for things, then it might be Knights of Labor, it might be the IWW. But this was our first one. So when in doubt on the AP exam, all right, a labor question, and you don't know, if you're taking a guess, you see AFL, answer it. Because half the time you're going to be right, okay, in the history of the United States. The guy that founded it and led it was Samuel Gompers. Here are words to remember with it. Samuel Gompers, and this is different from labor unions today, did not want to be involved in politics. He didn't care who was president. He didn't care who was the senator or, or House of Representatives. His thing was, 
We're the workers, we're going to go to the management and we're going to get where we want to have safer working conditions, we want to have a working pay. All right, doesn't care who's president. Bread and butter. We're going for the basics. We're not going to go for a Cadillac health care plan or a pension plan. We're going to go for what normal workers have. Reason why it was successful. Haley, you can't be in this union. You're unskilled. Taylor, you and whoever else is skilled, you're able to be in it. How does that help? They can't replace him. Right. If you have a skill that you're as hard to replace, when you then go on strike, and here are the words you have to know, no matter what time period it is. And here, if there's anything you remember for unions, no matter what time period it is, these are the words you need to know. Collective bargaining, strikes, and scabs. Collective together. What does it mean when you bargain? Agree. Agree. Compromise. Compromise. Negotiate. So together, so collectively together, if you all are the workers, you are going to bargain with me to get better health care, safer conditions, a more salary, an eight-hour workday instead of the 12-hour workday. What's your biggest weapon that you have against me? Yeah, a strike. So that's when they need to stop working. Right, you got to stop working. Now, when you stop working, what am I going to do? And what am I going to replace you with? And here's the other term. A scab. They replace them with scabs. This is why the AFL was successful and the Knights of Labor wasn't. Because when unskilled labor went on strike, does it take is it very easy or very hard for me to replace them? But when skilled labor goes on strike, is it hard? Here's the downfall of unions historically. Okay, not all of them here. A lot of things with it, and notice we have our ist here. Socialist, communist, and anarchist. What ends up happening with it, these groups says they are associated with, not always, but they are. And so this is where they're affiliated, to get affiliated with them. Also, immigrants are involved. Do people like immigrants? No, they didn't. And so here's where you have a lot of these, and we're going to kind of see in our next section where we're going to have this go against them. Yeah. All right. The difference between communists say the government own everything. Socialists say that the government owns the main industries. So they're going to own the steel mills, take it away from Carnegie and give it to the U.S. government, and then the government pays for the main thing. We'll still have other smaller businesses, but the main things, railroads. Steel mills, electric plants are all bailed by the government. And, and anarchists true. say no government. <laughs> okay, so they're extreme. Why is it, why is, like so I understand socialism is bad, but like why, is what, is it bad for the government? In theory, it's good. All right, go ahead and stop it. We're gonna, we won't finish the word. Make sure that you know with collective bargaining, um, strikes, and scabs. Also, there's, here's a couple of the main themes when it comes to the unions. One problem that they had at this time period, and they still have some of the problems with this, is different groups that would be seen as more extremist groups that were involved with it. Um, communist, socialist, anarchist. And when we ended yesterday, I was kind of going over a little bit of what is the difference there. In communism and socialism, the main difference, and I'm keeping this very, very simple, is, is communism would be that there's total government control and everybody's equal. Um, in socialism, we have government control of just some of the main industries. And where Haley, you were saying yesterday that where people say Obama was socialist, well, this is where they say he's taking over the healthcare industry. Um, this is why when when the government went and did the the bailout of the of GM, and people said, well, this is the government. This is they're taking control of the automobile industry, um, which they are having it where GM, where they own some of the stocks. It was kind of a mixture of things, but then the free it. Here is another union where we had the Knights of Labor and we had the AFL. And the AFL's biggest. Here's a third union from this period that you do need to know. Um, it becomes very powerful for a very short time. The IWW, better known as the Wobblies. Um, 
their leader is Big Bill Hayward, and <coughs> he and the thing that you have in here, this is where a lot of the ideas they have is Marxism, which is a lot of the same ideas of, of communism. Here's where we really see that tie in together of communists working with unions. Um, they became extremely powerful for a short period of time, may have been the most powerful full union in the United States for a real brief time, but, but the AFL most of the time had it. But the thing that you notice with the name, International, it was a union all over the world. One branch of this union was a group that was in Russia. And this would be some of the people that would lead into the communist revolution and the red revolution that would occur during World War I. Which, when we come back from World War I, we're going to have the Red Scare in the United States where we don't want anything to do with communism. So if this union has a lot of affiliation with communism, guess what happens to it after World War I? Bye-bye. Yeah, it goes. And, and it just, I mean, it, it goes away. And the main union that we didn't have is the AFL. And that's why I told you that when in doubt, okay, the AFL is the one that keeps going along. Today, what's the biggest union that we have? The AFL. Okay, it's the AFL CIO combined together, which they were together, they split, and then they come back together. But that's why I don't go extremely deep into union history. I'm sorry for all of you that I've gotten really excited because I can feel the excitement in this room that you're coming back saying, all right, good, a few more minutes of union history. Okay, I mean, maybe we can write about this too. Um. All right, here's where what are the things when you look at what unions did. One of the biggest things is that they did for hours. Um, a lot of times you'll see things and people say you're going to be thankful for an eight-hour workday. Thank the unions. If you worked in Andrew, Andrew Carnegie's steel mill factory, you worked a 12-hour day. And that's 12 hours of hard work. Um, Are you paid overtime? No. Did you no, no, no. There was no pay overtime. And this is where what I was mentioning yesterday about um, Fisk, when he took over, one of the things that he did is he actually cut the, cut the pay during that time. Um, there was a time period in one of the plants for Carnegie's plant that they actually operated seven days a week. But you could get sun Sunday off if you worked a double shift. Now, what is a double shift of 12 hours? Yeah, you work 24 straight hours, so you can get 24 hours off. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't very common, but again, that was something that at one time. And so over time, during the late 1800s and 1900s, they did the hours. The working conditions changed a lot, and this is where, um, Haley, you mentioned this a couple days ago. We would have the, or sorry, Sarah, I think you mentioned it, uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. In the early 1900s, we had this factory, and you see, and this actually had multiple effects, not just with safety um, there, but you see where this building was, up in the upper stories of it, the shirtwaist was a shirt that they had, and where they were sewing it, a fire started in one of the scrap bins, it quickly went to, to and burned um, on the upper levels there. They had locked the out, a lot of the outside exits, and basically made it where there was only one way in and out of those areas. Anyone have a guess of why they were locking everything up? Well, not so much people, but so the workers could steal things or go out and do things. So they were trying to keep it, they didn't trust the workers to make sure. Well, if your <laughs> exit doors are locked up and you have a fire, guess what ends up happening? Not that. Yeah, uh -huh. and I believe it was 146 women died uh, in this fire. The other problem that they had, and, and this is where, where we'll see when we do the part for urbanization, a bigger, another change that happened was they found out that where we built all these skyscrapers, did they have fire trucks that could reach that high? No, because then usually our public, our infrastructure is behind, and they didn't have any fire trucks that could go up and spray wire, water or rescue the people on the higher floors anyway. So basically you have a lot of women that were working in this factory that burned to death. Um, and this is where a lot of the things that the unions would fight for. Um, company towns. We're going to have it where in some places they would have come down. There's going to be good and bad about a company town. Let's say that a giant factory, GM decided to come and build a giant factory here in Inverness. And what they would do is they'd have a company store. If you work for GM, you can buy things cheaper. It'd almost be like their own little Sam's that they have. Um, 
But what ended up happening with the Catholic towns is they would go and they would completely own the whole town. So you worked for for the company, but where you rented your house, it was from the company or your apartment. Your store that you went buy your food was owned by your boss. Which they could turn around and they could give you a raise in salary, but they could turn around and also raise your rent. Are they still going to make the money off of you? And so that's one thing that unions were trying to work to make sure with that. Another thing that unions worked for were a lot of the child labor laws. Uh, now, you could say that there is a motive that they had with a selfish motive. Besides safety and maybe just being wrong for hiring children, why would unions not want children to be hired? They're on skill. On skill, no less. They take the jobs away. Would you have to pay pay a child as much as a grown person, especially a grown man? So that is where that's why unions also it wasn't just a safety of fact, but that's where. Um, look. And remember from people reports we had Mother Jones, uh, Mary Harris Jones. Who, who was a person that had fought for this. She was in the, in the union, but also for, for women's rights. When we get to the next section with the progressivism, we're gonna see that they actually passed a child labor law uh, at that time, which would then be declared unconstitutional, but there would be effects of it. Well, it becomes that unconstitutional is can you force a business to do certain things? And, and basically, the, the Supreme Court, a lot of times when you declare something unconstitutional, you say, this is why, and Congress rewrites the law, okay, now you did it right. Okay, it's, and that's what they ended up doing um, at that time. All right, here are basic informations. Uh, notice I had the SFIs with that, okay? Knowing those certain unions, knowing those people with it. That way you have something concrete. Here's your broad ideas. Most of the time, the government, when there was a strike, they went on the factory owner side. They did not side with, with, with the workers. Our very first president, again, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but this is not too far ahead. The very first president that would, and really not even be on the side of the workers, but it would at least do arbitration, which means you were in the middle, would be Teddy Roosevelt. So it would not be until we get to 1900 that we would see, see that the government is not supporting this. So think of those robber barons. They had the government on their side. One of the biggest strikes that we had, and here's where there's only, I'm only giving you a couple of strikes, and these are kind of your basic must-knows. Again, I know you really want to go deep in union history. Uh, maybe that can be your Christmas break research project that you do on your own there. Um, one of the biggest that we had that changed in history was the Homestead, Homestead Steel Mill strike. This is not anything with the Homestead Act. This steel mill was owned by Carnegie. Now, Carnegie was gone when the strike took place because he put Fisk in charge, and a lot of those changes that Fisk did. And what ultimately happened was there were so many accidents that was happening and so many people that were ended up dying on the job that the workers went on strike. When they went on strike, they basically barricaded it where no scabs could come in. Well, they decided that with to get it where they could bring scabs in. And what happened was is the is Fisk ended up hiring Pinkerton agents. Now, Pinkerton agents, Pinkerton agency is known as like a like a spy agency. Um, well, and things, but realistically, they were almost like hired guards at that time, almost like mercenaries. And Fisk hired them to come in and help get, get it where the scabs could come in. Ultimately, what ended up happening, and I don't remember how many people ended up dying, but seven or eight of the people that were striking ended up dying. The Pinkerton agents had fired into it. And who did the government side with? Yeah, the business owner. But it was a lot of backlash, and this is part with Carnegie when he comes back to America and people are looking at things and saying, all right, what are you doing? I mean, you're, you're here, and it's just, I mean, people are getting killed because they want to at least have a safe place to work. And that's where the impact would come down in there. But so this broke the union with the National Guard. Okay, the, the, the government comes in and breaks up the union and breaks up the strike. That's when. All right, Mikey, what's your question? Yeah. Okay. All right, your other big strike to remember 
Um, and Haymaker Square would be a, a, a third one. So try, sometimes I try to give you three things on here, but Haymaker Square, which was kind of what ended up um, the, the nice flavor that we had earlier. But Pullman Strike. Now in our section on railroads, we had the Pullman Sleepers. This is something that this 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 factory they made those railroad cars that you that had little, little areas for sleeping in it. Well, the people lived in a company town, where I just described the company town to you a little bit ago. What they ended up doing was cutting their wages, but didn't cut their way, their their rent or in the prices of the store. Um, so it was like it was worse than just a regular pay cut in that way, and they had no choice because they had to live in it. The reason why this strike ends up becoming a little bit better known is we will have now what will end up being the, one of the largest leaders in the early 1900s emerge. Because Eugene Debs would, would be the one that would lead this strike and for many times he would then be running for president under the Socialist Party. Notice once again the association with socialists with unions. Um, and where we, we get America, I mean, we always uh, look at things, communism bad, socialism bad. All right, if you want to make someone look bad, you just call them communist or socialist, even if you, whether or not you have background. To tell you how it was 100 years ago in 1912, Eugene Debs got, got about 10% of the vote in America running as a socialist. Um, there were some places like Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that you would have it that they were mayors that were socialist. Um, the Socialist Party was actually a very active party in various parts of the United States. Um, this would be before World War I. The Red Scare would come about um, and kind of eliminate that. Um, but that's where Eugene Debs comes about in this Pullman strike. And, uh, and besides the Pullman strike, besides Eugene Debs, the idea in this with the company town is the only the other thing to associate with it. But once again, with the Pullman strike, guess what side the government sided on? And the business owners, and that's kind of the theme. When in doubt, it's the business owners. All right, and that's the end of the unions. Yeah. Yeah.